raise your hand. Okay, that's not enough. <laughs>
listing is just a handful of the 50 or more arts organizations, studios, and businesses that were in the city of Asheville. I am Phyllis Lang. And I am Deborah Austin. Phyllis. <laughs> A writer, researcher, video producer, and educator moved to Asheville in 1979 and immediately became a volunteer with the Arts Journal, a monthly magazine on newsprint. She became editor in 1981 and served as editor and publisher through the majority of the decade. Deborah, almost a native, arrived in Asheville when she was two weeks old. <laughs> As a teenager, she worked with Tanglewood Children's Theater, Brandywine Players, and Asheville Community Theater. She toured England with Monfort Park Players and led her company, Bittersweet Productions, to Kiev, Ukraine with a production of The Grapes of Wrath. Deborah spent the 1980s weaving baskets and serving as the director of the Community Arts Council. All right, how many natives in the audience? Raise your hand. How many other almost natives? You, you were in grade school. <laughs> All right, how many arrived in the last five years? Ten years. Twenty years. All right, how many of you were students and you came to college or school here and you stayed? So many, how many of you were here in the 1980s? Remember the 80s? Wherever you were, you witnessed the development of the modern internet. By 1989, approximately 1.1 million people were on the web, with 86% in the United States. The issue of global warming came to the attention of the public largely due to the Yellowstone fires of 1988. Michael Jackson was the definitive icon. His leather jacket, glove, and moonwalk dance were often imitated. The highest grossing movies were action and science fiction films. E.T., several Star Wars, Indiana Jones Adventures, Batman, and two Back to the Futures. Fashion was big. Big hair, big shoulders, big jewelry, and bright colors. Television shows Miami Vice and Magnum P.I. brought color to the man's wardrobe. The 1980s saw the Tenement Square protest the identification of a retrovirus that causes HIV infection, Hurricane Hugo, the death of John Lennon, and the eruption of Mount St. Helens. In local news, the cityscape of Asheville changed as the north side of Pack Square was torn down and the Axona building designed by I.M. Pei opened in 1981. If you lived here or were a visitor, you might have viewed works by American Impressionists as you explored the Asheville Art Museum in the basement of the Civic Center. Or you walked down South Market Street where Wanda Henry Coleman, director of the YMI, welcomed you to an exhibition of portraits by Everett Johnson. You caught a blue plate special performance in the shadow of the Vance Monument or performed in the fine arts with Smoky Mountain Repertory Theater. You may have used your library card to check out Rick Boyer's prize-winning novel, Billingsgate Shoal. As editor of Places Rated Almanac, Boyer named Asheville America's most livable small city in the 1981 edition. Cities were rated on nine categories, including climate, crime, economics, and the arts. Rick and his family moved to Asheville soon thereafter. Asheville Art Museum was your destination for the premiere of Movable Parts by Asheville Contemporary Dance Theater. A trip to UNCA's Lipinski Auditorium was rewarded with Wall Street Dance Peace. Wall Street Dance Works' new piece, Strange Attraction. You met a group of friends, all members of the Asheville 1000, for the <laughs> cinematique film, Boat People. 
Later in the summer, you gathered for the screwball comedy Bringing Up Baby at Pack Library. Long about sundown, you wandered into Shindig on the Green. Dancers moved across the stage as you pulled out your fiddle for an impromptu jam on the steps of City Hall. Or on a hot Saturday afternoon, you got your feet on the street for the downtown Asheville blowout called Bell Share. You may have sat in this room for a lecture by author Alex Haley, sponsored by the Writers Workshop. You toured Monfort Homes as part of the Preservation Society's Heritage you join neighbors in Malvern Hills for a Sunday in the Park concert by the Red Clay Ramblers. This free summer program was a joint project of Quality Forward, Asheville Parks and Recreation, and the Community Arts Council. You read a copy of the Arts Journal. <laughs> As an editor, looking back at those issues, I see a lively narrative of the struggles and triumphs of visual artists, performers, and writers. We were a spunky bunch <laughs> in the stone building on Charlotte Street who thought there was an audience for stories about the arts. And so the magazine advocated, promoted, and publicized all the arts every month. You attended the Asheville Symphony to see the new conductor, Robert Hart Baker, in action. <laughs> Conducting Tchaikovsky's Symphony Number no. Four. You auditioned for Asheville Community Theater's next show, The Women, with 38 female roles. How could you lose? <laughs> Maybe you stopped at a dancer's place on Patton Avenue for a pair of tap shoes and then walked over to Broadway to join other volunteers renovating WCQS's new offices and studio. You bought a cutting board from Bob Brunk at the Guild Fair of the Southern Highland Handicraft Guild, or added to your collection of cat posters from the Village Art Craft Fair. An autumn weekend passed you by as you read John Healy's novel, The Winter People. And then you went to the theater at Innsbruck Mall to see the movie version filmed in Western North Carolina. John Ely grew up in Asheville and set many of his novels in these mountains. You visited Highwater Center, an artist cooperative on the other river, the Swannanoa. Many of the artists who shared that address still live and work in Asheville. You waited in line for tickets <laughs> to see Barishnikov dance on the stage at the Thomas Wolfe Auditorium. If you read the Asheville Citizen Times, you'll recognize the cartoonist, David Cohen. And it reads, wow, shoot, I thought he was going to do some jumping. He doesn't have to do anything. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and that is just a short list of Asheville Arts you may have sampled or helped create. We have a great gathering of individuals serving as panelists and in resource chairs. As we read their introductions, you will hear the richness and diversity of the arts in the decade of the 1980s. Tonight's panelists are Dick Cole, Connie Bostick, Ralph Redpath, and Ann Dunn. Now Dick raised his hand as an almost native he was three years old when he arrived. As a student, he was drum major of the Lee Edwards Marching Band and played trumpet in ensembles for ACT and Tanglewood Children's Theater. Just out of high school, he served as the musical director for the Asheville Youth Theater production of West Side Story. He returned to Asheville in 1977 with a degree in music from the University of Maryland and went on to get a master's degree from Western Carolina University. In the 1980s, Dick toured with the Howard Hanger Jazz Fantasy and became a familiar voice on WCQS. Connie Bostick came to Asheville in the, late, in the early 1970s. A 
visual artist, she has exhibited her work nationally and internationally. In the 1980s, Connie was associated with the World Gallery and owned the popular bar Craig's on Wall Street, which became the Asheville Music Hall. In 1991, she opened Zone 1, one of the first contemporary art galleries in Asheville. It was a linchpin for downtown's lively Biltmore Avenue for most of a decade. Connie has been called the President Emeritus of all things art in Western North Carolina. Ralph Redpath, a native Californian, came to Western North Carolina in 1971 to join the acting company at Flatwalk Playhouse. With a master's degree from Yale Drama, the young actor toured regional theaters ranging from Alaska repertory to Virginia's Barter Theater. In October of 1986, he bid farewell to LA. Stopping at Flat Rock, he heard, ACT needs a director. His contract to direct one show grew to 68 plays in the next 11 seasons. He has worked with companies across Western North Carolina as actor, director, and teacher. Ann Dunn is a poet, dancer, choreographer, educator, and cross-disciplinary artist. She arrived in Asheville in 1980, already an artist of national repute, as a principal ballerina with the Hartford Ballet and the American Ballet, and choreographer for the New York City Opera at Lincoln Center. Anne immediately established herself as a practitioner and advocate in the local and statewide arts world. She is artistic director and CEO of the Asheville Ballet, the oldest professional nonprofit ballet company in North Carolina. She wrote dance criticism for the Arts Journal during the 80s, has published three volumes of poetry, and is a full-time faculty member at UNC Asheville. I'm also delighted to welcome our resource team, eight voices who add to the story of the arts in Asheville. Asheville native Andrea Clark is a photographer, playwright, and painter of chairs. Her images captured the African American neighborhood in downtown Asheville before it was erased by urban renewal. Her one act play, The Road, tells of one family's loss of house and home to the widening of the road to create a direct route from College Street to Biltmore Avenue. Katie Kramer, born in St. Joseph's Hospital, is a founding member of Blue Plate Special. In addition to performing in Blue Plate shorts and general zaniness during the 1980s, she appeared with Smoky Mountain Repertory Theater, Callahan's of Players, Asheville Repertory Theater, and the Montfort Park Players. She also graced the cover of the premier issue, April 1981, of Handmade Magazine, written and published in Asheville. A native Texan, David Holt graduated from the University of California at Santa Barbara with degrees in biology and art. He moved to Western North Carolina in 1973 <coughs> to pursue his growing interest in traditional music and storytelling. David founded and directed the Appalachian Music Program at Warren Wilson College. Four-time Grammy Award winner, he tours extensively and hosts TV programs presenting traditional music of North Carolina. Porridge Buck and her husband, Lewis, moved from Maine to Asheville in 1984 with their press and Talio Relief Society. After operating a studio in Monfort for three years, they purchased Williams Feed and Seed on Lyman Street. Their warehouse studios was the first shared studio space years before the River Arts District came into existence. Riverlink purchased the building in 1992 and the Bucks moved Black Mountain. Flood Gallery hosted a retrospective exhibition of Porch's print work in 2011. After a career in Great Basin Archaeology, Barbara Sayer moved to Asheville in the late 1970s. 
after trying her hand at earthworm farming and sheet rock hanging, she went on to work at WCQS in 1981. Her first job at the small 10-watt station on the UNCA campus was to clean the bathroom. It's been uphill ever since. <laughs> Barbara is WCQS program director. Tony Kiss was born across the mountains in Kingsport, Tennessee. After receiving a bachelor's degree in journalism from East Tennessee State and several years experience as a reporter, he arrived in Asheville, he knows the date, May 10th, 1984, as the arts and entertainment writer for the Citizen Times. Throughout the 80s, Tony encouraged expanded arts coverage and spread the word through a radio show with David Horan, which ran every Friday morning for 30 years. He became the arts and entertainment editor, and two years ago, his beat became festivals, the Biltmore Estate, breweries, wineries, distilleries, and cider makers. <laughs> yes, that is a picture of Tony Kiss with Jim and Tammy Baker <laughs> at Brevard Music Center for a concert by Sid Caesar. <laughs> and 
and the other members of the jazz fantasy, which was actually, it's not kind of a misnomer, but it was a whole lot better than the five-member Howard Hanger Jazz Trio. <laughs> with, with these folks, I was able to play challenging music in places as diverse as the, the back of a flatbed truck in St. Louis, uh, an improvised stage in Panama, school cafeterias across South Carolina, and the stage of the Thomas Wolfe Auditorium with the Asheville Symphony. They actually commissioned a piece from Howard, which we played with the Asheville Symphony. I spent five creative and rewarding years with Howard and those other musicians before I finally confronted the Catch-22 that has become, well, it's always confounded touring musicians. It just took me five years to figure it out. The more successful the group became, the less time I would have with my wife and children. A lot of people don't have those wives and children because of that kind of thing. So I reluctantly left to find a real job. I had a real job for a short period of time in the, uh, oh, the building that, that some of you booed uh, during the slideshow, the IMPA building, I worked there. Um, they let me work there for a few years. Every morning I would uh, leave to, and get in my car and I had two minutes. I, uh, and I would hear on the radio the junction of Morning Edition and Classical Music on WCQS. Chip Kaufman was on the air at that time, and I said, man. So, long story short, WCQS eventually hired me, again with a cut in pay, and uh, hired me as a classical music host and audio engineer. At that time, the station was in brand new facilities downtown, right where it is now, 30 years later at 73 Broadway. I think I was the fifth employee. Within a few months, we were airing concerts from the Swanadoa Chamber Music Festival, doing a live broadcast of the Billy Taylor Trio from the SNW at that year's uh, Bell Share. And we continued our broadcast of the Asheville Symphony's uh, concerts, which had been going for a long time by the time I got there in 1986. As someone who grew up in Asheville and whose kids grew up in Asheville, my memories of that time are of a vibrant and creative community. It's true that downtown had been sort of hollowed out by the movement of businesses to the suburban malls, but I don't think that the artistic life of the city was really hampered by that. I didn't think so at the time, anyway. The ASO got his first full-time resident conductor in 1981. He was actually required to live in Asheville. You wouldn't get that anymore. The previous conductor, Bob Welch, had uh, a couple years later, or earlier, required that the players be paid for the first time. The ASC Youth Orchestra goes back to 1969. Uh, the ASO started a strings program in the public schools starting in 1979. The National Chamber Music Series continued to present high quality performances as it had since 1952, and the Community Concert Association filled Thomas Wolfe Auditorium with its presentations, as did the Mountain Dance and Folk Festival. So my time is up. Um, there are people here that know a whole lot more than I do about what happened in the 80s. You know, they say if you, if you live through the 60s, you can't remember them. So I, I really look forward to the questions and answers that come later. Thank you for having me. Uh, the Fletcher School of Dance, 
uh, founded by Peggy and Beale Fletcher and run also by their uh, son and daughter-in-law, Linda, Linda and Walter Fletcher, ballet, tap, jazz, um, and acrobatics. There were plugging groups and, of course, uh, multicultural with the mountain dance and folk festival. Um, since that time, at the, during the 80s, there was a lot of dance criticism, a lot of dance criticism, which I don't see much of anymore, which is interesting. Actually, um, when I was researching this uh, for today, I did notice that the 80s were in some ways more vibrant in the arts than they are today in some aspects. So I thought that was really interesting in my, in my recollection. Um, a lot more dance criticism. Um, and dance education, the Arts Journal, Asheville Citizen Times, WCQS, etc. There were collaborations among local arts organizations. We collaborated with the Asheville Symphony, the Asheville Choral Society, many visual, music, and literary artists. There was a lot of outreach in dance, in nursing homes, parks, rec centers, churches, the YMI. We collaborated with the Tridestone Missionary Baptist Church and, um, and, uh, and a, uh, we did a Hanukkah performance at Christmas, a lot of outreach. There were site-specific performances downtown, in art galleries, in store windows. There was a lot of touring by the Asheville Ballet, New York City, Yale University, Atlanta, France, Italy. Um, they, I co-founded the North Carolina Dance Alliance in the 80s, uh, two dance camps, Deer Track and the Blue Ridge Summer Dance Camp, which is still going, which starts this Sunday. Belcher was a place where local artists could perform, uh, which was nice. CART was an important thing that happened, which was a huge community outreach program uh, that I ran for the Community Arts Council, a uh, huge. We danced in tobacco barns, in factories, and we did an art parade through downtown on a fire truck with dancers hanging off of the fire truck. Um, then uh, there was dance in the schools was a priority for the city for the county, for the state. Uh, funding for dancing in the schools was a big priority. So there was a lot. Sometimes we did four concerts a day in schools on cafetorians, on hot dog skins. Um, <laughs> reviews and promotion, reviews and promotion, WCQS, the Citizen Arts, Arts Journal of Dance uh, was, was huge and was really important. There were producing organizations that brought dancers in the Asheville Concert, Association, the Community Arts Council, Asheville Ballet, we brought people, we brought Anna Sokolow, Baryshnikov, uh, Maya Pazetskaya by Fletcher School of Dance. Funding for dance was a huge um, priority for the Arts Council at the time, and uh, we benefited from that. Quality Forward, Junior League, private patronage, state, national, and foundation funding were all available. And of course, dance training in Asheville was gigantic for such a small community to send dancers who were well trained enough to get into the Kirov Academy, the Juilliard School, SUNY Purchase, and many other amazing places. It all came out of the Asheville Ballet. Poetry Alive was huge in 1984, founded and huge and is still going strong. Storytelling festivals and gatherings. I founded Poetry in the Prisons for Western North Carolina and got a nice little certificate for that. And I have some of the poems from students when I was a poet in the schools and um, also prisoners, if anybody wants to look at them. Malaprops and Little Snowbird had, and UNCA had poetry readings. And there were publishing houses locally and also the Arts Journal published poetry. And there are people in this room who know more about it than I do. So there you go. <laughs> Moby Dick that she presented and directed. Asheville Repertory Theater, 
Steve Chapman back there, he remembers those days. Uh, neat, funky kind of off-Broadway stuff, more contemporary. Um, and of course, National Community Theater, which I you know, ran for those 11 years. Uh, you know, there is the history of art and organizations and all of that, and then there is the experience of art. And it seems to me that that's why we do it or we look at it or we go see it. Because the idea is, can we take that experience and expand ourselves just a little bit? And I want to just mention a couple of those that happened while I was at ACT. And uh, one of the things I was really proud of uh, in the first or second year there, we decided during Black History Month, which is uh, in February, we should do plays that featured the African American experience. And it was difficult to do because, just like in this room, there weren't a lot of black folks that were coming to ACT, so getting the show cast was a little bit uh, difficult, but we had Rocky Fulp cast on that. Janet Oliver, and the first uh, play we did was Raisin in the Sun, which quite frankly, they should bring back and do it again. Still one of the great plays. And so I had kind of the outline of the cast, but if you know that play, there's the character of the mother which is really seminal because she's the force that kind of binds everybody together. And I thought, well, got to do this play, don't know anybody, don't know any black folks. And in through the door walked Becky Stone. <laughs> and I thought, hallelujah, I am saved. <laughs> uh, and she, of course, played the mother, and that was one of our first successes there. And there's another moment I'm going to talk about real briefly when we were doing um, Driving Miss Daisy, again, a play that you probably all know. Oh, here comes Barbara with the thing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the uh, indomitable Hazel Robinson played Miss Daisy. And, and uh, George Rowland, it was a wonderful, it was the best hoke I ever saw. It was fabulous. And there's, this still uh, moves me. But there's a, a moment when, uh, in the play where they have gone off, Polka's of course is the chauffeur, to uh, tend to, to, to some graves at a cemetery. And Miss Daisy, Daisy says to Hope, go over there, and she gives him the name that's on the tombstone. Would you go tend to that one? And he goes over and tries to pretend like he knows what he's doing. And finally he comes back and she says, well, what's the matter? And he says, well, what'd that look like? She says, what are you talking about? And he says, I'm talking about I can't read. That is the power of art, to take our experience and allow us for just a moment to enter in in some way in the experience of another person. I'm a Southern California kid, you know, went to school and college and all that, and there was like, what do you mean you can't read? And that experience just informs so much, obviously, of his life. And we get to see that in the play. <laughs> The other thing I'm really proud of while here while I was at, at ACT uh, was the birth of the auto players. Uh, and, and if any of you have ever had a thought about maybe you'd like to try this stuff, uh, it's Reader's Theater and they go to nursing homes and all kinds of places. Deborah has more uh, information on that. And that's something that started over dinner conversations, been going now for over 20 years. So um, that's my story. Thank you. Thank you. seven dogs, two horses, and five children. So um, I didn't get involved in the art world right away. When I moved to Asheville, everything that was going on with the arts was pretty much centered around the art department at UNCA. Tucker Cook was department head. Uh, Yas Vandermeer was teaching there, and Elma Johnson was teaching everything you can imagine. She was teaching absolutely, you know, like metalworking and weaving and ceramics and everything. So um, when I think about what's happened since then, a lot of it has to do with new people coming in. Um, when Forge and Lewis Buck moved here, there was a shift in how people thought about art and what art meant to them. 
um, Ford and Lewis were very low key in so many ways, but there was a shift just because they were here and because of what they did and the way they did it. Um, a few years, I guess about the same time, Kevin Hogan moved here, and there was another shift of an entirely different kind. Um, it was a little more belligerent, and um, silhouettes of headless running men appeared on a number of buildings downtown. <laughs> so, so there was a definite shift there. Then later on, Bob Godfrey came as head of the department out of Western Carolina, and one of the things that I missed most about those days was the fact that in the 80s, we had the Arts Journal. Gave you a lot of information about what was going on and who was doing what. We had another newspaper published in Winston Salem called Art Boo, which was a serious critical journal. And from Western Carolina, we had a magazine that was published a couple times a year called Crits. The Asheville Citizen Times published regular articles about art. And I don't mean fluffy little stories about a particular artist. They published real criticism. And we just, we don't have that anywhere now. We don't have no art criticism at all, which is a shame. It's a real loss. Um, I was thinking about how many more artists there are in Asheville now than there used to be. And then I started writing a list of all the artists that I knew in the 80s, and it got to be a really long list. So I was very surprised. The other remarkable thing was that Deb Austin was in charge of the Arts Council then. She knew every artist in town. She knew what they were doing. And more importantly, she knew why they were doing it. So that was an amazing, an amazing thing to have. And it's something we haven't had since then. Several years I had a little bar on Wall Street, and um, we had art exhibitions there. And I sold more art out of that bar than I ever did when I had a gallery. So, I don't know if it had to do with the quality of the work or the people who came there or how much they drank, but I did sell more art there. Um, the World Gallery was the first, I think it's probably been the only purposely nonprofit gallery ever on the um, there have been a lot that ended up being nonprofit, but it was not meant to be that way. But um, the World Gallery was a nonprofit gallery, and it um, didn't last very long. The AIDS crisis came, and we were operating under the umbrella of Western Carolina University. We did an exhibition of art made by an Atlanta artist in collaboration with people who were actually suffering from AIDS. And this was something you didn't even talk about during that period. You didn't even talk about it. Um, we were able to borrow some um, key carrying pieces. He had died. Um, we borrowed a couple of Maple Thorpes. And um, another North Carolina artist who died, whose name I've forgotten. Anyhow, at one point, this very well-dressed man who didn't look at all like people who normally came, showed up, walked in, went straight to the back, looked at the Maple Thorpes, left, and um, within no time at all, Western had pulled their sponsorship away from us. So, so that was the end of the World Gallery. And then after that, um, I opened Zone One, which I ran for about 10 years. And it was also nonprofit, but not purposely. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but watching, watching what's happened here has been really remarkable in so many ways. Um, I don't know who was responsible or how it happened, but in like, I think 91, a man named Halsey North came down to Asheville from New York City. The rumor was that he was paid like 80 grand to tell us what needed to happen to the arts in Asheville. And he wrote down in black and white that he was gonna make this decision based on talking to 26 people who either had or had access to large amounts of money. And that's when there was a really big shift, particularly in the visual arts in Asheville. So um, it's been an interesting thing to watch. Um, in the 80s, you could get a studio downtown, 60 bucks a month, including utilities. Um, that's not the case anymore. Um, so it was, it, you know, it's just been a really remarkable thing to watch what's happened here. 
Um, there are some things that I think are really great about the way things have gone, some other things that I'd really love to be able to change. But um, my involvement with the Black Mountain College Museum and Arts Center has been very satisfying, and being able to watch that organization grow and prosper over the last 20 years has been really satisfying. So, thank you.
So we sang, stand up, and sang a song, and I sat down, and I heard the drums start, and I looked over, and the doors open. And coming through the door, Giles first, bare ass. <laughs> other guys, bare ass. <laughs> I thought, okay. I wonder what my day job is going to look like. <laughs> they actually did have thongs, but nonetheless, you couldn't tell them when they were coming in the room. That was the beginning of Jubilee. <laughs> believe it or not, we're still going. So.
So, I'm going to tell you the story of when Barishnikov came to town. Dan Yuji, if you'd like to stand, that would be fine. So, the Arts Council, much like the Marines, was the toughest job you would ever love. Now, you don't remember this, of course, but before I was at the Arts Council, I worked for Connie Bostick, where one of my jobs was judging the Miss Gay Asheville pageant. <laughs> and I will tell you that I was the only naturally born woman in the room, and I was the least attractive one. <laughs> but the moment of working at the Arts Council, that, but there were so many things we did, Deborah. We, we were in so many different offices, and we would get some space somewhere, and we'd be there for a while, and we were in the Northwest Bank building, we were at where John Rogers is now, and then we got to move to Billmore Avenue, where the staff renovated the offices, because we were tough, and we could do anything. The other thing we did was bell share. Bell share. Some of us remember it fondly from years ago. Some of it some of us are glad to have bid it a fond farewell. But one bell share I remember, it was Sunday. The street smelled of beer and fried onions. There were still people sleeping in the doorways. We were exhausted. We had probably renovated the office the week before bell share, and then bell share happened, and on Sunday night, we had to turn around and go to the airport to pick up Barishnikov. I want you to imagine that we are young, vibrant people who are beyond the point of exhaustion. And we are going to meet an internationally known dancer at the Asheville Airport. The Asheville Airport. <laughs> And we are going to bring him back to Asheville and get him and his company settled in. So, we're there, relatively clean, though I don't think any of us had time to shower before that. But we were zombies. Zombies. And so the limo, because Barishnikov travels in a limo, the limo had arrived and Dan UG turns and we are all at the point of hysteria. Dan turns to look at the limo, and there is a dead bat caught in the grill. <laughs> and we all just fell out. And Dan started pointing and saying in a very, very reasonably good um, Russian accent, wait till he comes down the gang pl gangplank and points. He's bad. <laughs> He's bad? What is bad? I'm limousine. He's bad. So we're hysterical. We don't know how to get the bat off the limousine. We, we are people who have renovated an office and created Bell Share single-handedly. We are gods of the arts. But we can't figure out how to get rid of the bat. So at that point, the plane landed, and our job was to go to each of the person, each of the people in the company, and hand them a rose. Uh -huh. So they were approached by a field of zombies, <laughs> giggling about a bat and a bad Russian accent, and approaching them with thorned plants. <laughs> Yeah. 
including the person playing Antonio, but my brother was <laughs> But then um, came Mumford, oh, Mumford, Blue Plate Special. And um, the idea about Blue Plate initially was to perform street theater and what I think now might be called guerrilla theater, where um, you're performing, but no one knows that it's a play. It's not announced. And, um, we had some great moments with that, and one that sticks in my mind was when, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Catherine Derner and Molly, who was the co-founder of Blue Plate, they were in the laundromat on Merriman Avenue, and um, they had prearranged with, uh, what was her name, Marie, that ran the laundromat to do a little Blue Plate where two women would fight over those carts that you had <laughs> to laundry in. And so they were in the middle of this big fight, and they're tugging on the carts, when all of a sudden, a washer exploded. I mean, it was perfect. You couldn't have timed it better. Um, so those are my two moments for us.
really strong memory of 30 years ago this week of a live broadcast that WCQS did from Bell Share. It's the Billy Taylor Trio, live from the S and W. Yeah. And the S and W had been you know, abandoned for a while, and we sort of figured out that it could happen there. It was an extraordinary space. We were a very small station. We're not that big now, but we were really small then. We'd never done anything like it. Dick was there. And by the time we got it going, it was so packed. Every time the, the fire marshal came anywhere near the building, I got panicked, as did Deborah. And by the end, we had to put chairs out on the, the onto uh, Patton Avenue, and at one point we finally got the broadcast going. I mean, we were talking, you know, that thing when you hear people talk on the air and they're just you know, filling time because something isn't right. We finally got the broadcast going and the music was going, and I remember walking. We were located on the mezzanine. If any of you have been in that beautiful building, we were on the mezzanine, and I remember walking to the window and looking out and seeing that the crowd, we put speakers out on the sidewalk, the crowd went all the way up Haywood Street, all the way down Patton Avenue, and all the way up Patton Avenue, as far as the Vance Monument. I don't know what the crowd did after that, I couldn't see that far. It was a very beautiful night, and I just remember thinking how grateful I was. And well, my off the Arts Council office was, um, you entered either Wall Street or from Pritchard Park. So my office looked over Pritchard Park. After we finally got everything set up and it was going, I went, sat in my office, took my shoes off, put my feet up, and heard this incredible concert from across the street. <laughs> a number of memories here tonight, and these represent just a small <laughs> sample of the large tapestry of the arts in Asheville in the 1980s. To tell more of this story now, we prepared a handout that explores this week, 30 years ago, in 1986. Be sure to take it home and read it. You will discover that Gas in Asheville was 89 cents a gallon. Mm -hmm. Mark Pruitt Band was playing at Bill Stanley's Barbecue and Bluegrass. And Tony Kiss recommended the movie Aliens. <laughs> You'll also see details of our upcoming 1980s programs in August and September. How you can look at the videos of the three programs that have already taken place and how you can support the Friends of the North Carolina Room. And now, questions, comments. We have 20 minutes. <laughs> Memories, anything you wanted to comment about? Now, uh, what was the last name of the woman and her partner, the last name of the woman and her partner? She always played uh, Thomas Wolfe's mother and Mutt played the Casey Bradman. Casey Bradman, uh, one of the finest women, and a lot of people do not know that she studied with Stanislavski, who was the father, grandfather of modern drama. She played uh, Julia Wolfe's role of the Liza Gann in La Comrade Angel at all of the Flat Rock productions. And Ralph was both Eugene and Ben at one time or the other, and is going to do W.O. for readings at the Thomas Wolfe home in October. Well, for those of you who don't know me, 
My name is Chip Kaufman. I'm an announcer at WCQS, where I have been since 1983. I have been in theater long before that. I actually have a BA in drama and speech, which is probably why I sound so good on the radio. <laughs> but I want to just relate two frozen moments in time. One relates to theater, one relates to the radio, and they all have to do with things not going the way that you want them to go. Uh, I'll do the theater one first because I've been out of theater and I'm still in radio. <laughs> I came here with a group called the New Arts Theater that was located in Cahoots Restaurant on Grove Street. Who remembers Cahoots and our prior? We came there and we had an idea that we were going to do dinner theater and a show, get a meal and a show for $7.50. <laughs> That was back in 1983, and for a while it worked, but you might say it was sort of an idea ahead of its time. <laughs> but my story relates to Blue Plate Special. During Bell Share, we were doing a performance, a very condensed version of a segment of Catch-22 called Clevenger's Trial. Now, David Cohen was also in that scene, Peter Lorenz was in that scene. I was in that scene playing uh, a really tough army colonel. Actually, I believe I was a general. If you saw the movie, Orson Welles played the part. Uh, and what I was supposed to do, we were, you know, going put this guy on trial without really any evidence, and it was just sort of a piece of absurdist theater. Anyway, I had my hair cut very short. Uh, I had my mustache, my beard gone, and my mustache trimmed to look exactly like Hitler's. And uh, I had put some dark thing on it, which actually sweated off in the bell chair July 8th because it was too much. But there is a scene where I am interrogating David Cohen as Clevenger. And I had a very tight collar on so that it could, you know, make my face get really red and everything. And I pointed right at him, and I got so tight, I must have lost the blood to my head or something, I don't know, but as often happens in the theater, I forgot my line. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and all I can think to do is just point at David and say, well, what do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> the look of terror on his face was genuine. And I know that, because I actually, let's see, this is my NPR bag from my days in Charleston before I came. One of these days I must transfer this because I have it on film. <laughs> a friend of mine, a musician from Savannah, Georgia, who played with the Asheville Symphony, he came up with his eight millimeter movie camera and he photographed the scene. No sound, of course, but that's probably just as well. <laughs> So, but that was my theater moment where, oh my God, and of course, I don't even remember how David and I got out of it, but we did, and of course, everyone in the audience had no clue, because you just keep it going. Uh, that I remember quite vividly. The other one relates to my earliest days at WCQS, when we were in the Lipinski building. Barbara knows that we started there. We were WUNF. Uh, we changed our call letters because we got tired of people calling us to ask what happened to Masterpiece Theater. Because the TV and the radio had the same call letters, WUNF. But this is back in the days of LPs. Remember LPs? Okay, so we had to play classical music off of LPs. Which means that of course you didn't go anywhere if you had to go to the bathroom or anything because the record might get stuck. Well, one day, I had been at a dress rehearsal for a production of Amadeus. It ended at 2 a.m. Now, I signed on at WCQS. This is before morning edition. It's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and I signed on with this program called Sunrise Sampler, and I'm playing classical LPs. So I remember I put on a Haydn symphony. I remember it was number 83, which it is known as the hymn. And I was so tired, I fell asleep. 
<laughs> well, the record's playing. So finally, I, I of course don't remember this. I remember starting it. I remember leaning back in the chair, and then I remain, remember the phone on the console ringing. So I picked it up. Hello. And by this time, of course, the record is going. <laughs> and an irate listener said, it's over. <laughs> I thanked him very much, and then I started the next turn. So I just want you to think about that guy. He, he took his own advice, he said, and moved here. And we started a club called the Paradox Club. And uh, Rob Pauline, who helped start the Fiber Arts, and Rick and myself, uh, can't tell you what went on there too much, but we had a good time. <laughs> Ann Wissenhan. I worked for the City of Asheville Parks and Recreation Department in the 1980s and 90s. And uh, a richness to me in the 1980s, which I really want to bring to life, is the wonderful collaborative spirit that appeared, that um, was evident among everybody. All the arts organizations, particularly the City of Asheville and the Parks and Recreation Department, had a very strong focus on the arts and making sure it reached all neighborhoods of Asheville. And thanks to Leslie Anderson and Ray Casayas, um, devotion towards that, but our great collaborative opportunities occurred with Quality Forward as we took Sunday in the park to parks throughout Asheville that otherwise people have, would not have gone to those parks and would not have seen the local talent that we were able to book and enjoy at those places. Of course, Shindig on the Green uh, was another example. Bell Share, while it may be loved or hated, it did bring a lot of wonderful people together to collaborate and make such a a great um, attraction to downtown and, and show off our, our local tra talent as well as bring in a lot of new folks. Um, but I, I think there was such a rich richness in that collaboration that uh, occurred among all the folks and everybody really was working together to make sure uh, that we promoted the arts uh, in Asheville. Thank you, it's a room full of creators, and I'm not a creator, except I created a kid who grew up in the 80s. And just a couple of presents, one's already been mentioned, Bonford Park Players, and Poetry Alive. That was one of my memories from the 80s. Yeah. Well, my name is Bob Gersky. Uh, I came here in 1973, and back then, there was nothing here. I mean, we're talking, there were no restaurants, there were no radio stations. Um, there were a few bars that we frequented. Um, I was, and I am, a blacksmith, and I found it along with Bill Lennon. Uh, High Water Center. This is 1973, and 
it was an artist cooperative that we set up uh, long before um, the arts district as we know it. <clears throat> we were on the Swannanoa River. It flooded, and it flooded every year. <laughs> Hence the name, Flood Zone Studios, <laughs> which uh, later, uh, <coughs> well, actually started at Tidewater Center. Then it went to Flood Zone Studios. Um, at that time, we had a lot of sponsors. Now, this wasn't monetary sponsors. These were people that were very much in, <coughs> interested in what we were doing. Um, we rented the old Asheville Michael Company for the condemned warehouse. Um, Vance Field, who was the uh, a former mayor of Milton Forest, was the uh, uh, was involved with the, the executor of, of this, and he was our first sponsor. We rented this place for two hundred dollars a month. Um, it lasted for 21 years. In 1994, we got flooded up. The big flood, 94, 95 flood. Um, whereas the uh, inspectors, the building inspectors came in and closed us down. But our second sponsor was a man named Inspector Queen. He was a, a uh, Asheville fire or vice um, fire inspector. And he loved what we were doing. And he said, okay, if you folks keep the building clean, make sure the, the sprinkler system works, bring fire extinguishers in, I will keep the powers of be away. <laughs> this went on for 21 years until <laughs> He called up one day and said, I've got good news and I've got bad news. And I said, okay, Inspector Green, Green, what's the good news? He said, I'm retiring. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh God, I know what the bad news is. <laughs> well, the bad news was the inspectors came in. They wanted us. They wanted us bad. <laughs> now, we had fire uh, sprinkler systems that were inspected twice a year. Every studio had at least a fire extinguisher. It was basically a fairly clean environment, although artists of their own worst enemies, I have to tell you. They came in, there were five cars with four officers each with cameras on their shoulders, and they closed us down. But they did say, okay, if you fill out these forms, and if you do all of what we're asking, we'll keep you open. I said, great. Right. So we, we cleaned up, we brought in electricians, we did all of this, and we filled the forms and said, we did it. And then they gave us the next form, <laughs> and then the next form, and then the next form. And finally, they called uh, Progress Energy Snip the uh, wire. And that was the end. But it was 125 artisans went through that building, uh, many of which are involved uh, today as artists still. The other thing I have to say uh, Quality Forward with Susan Mayer at that time um, got together and decided that the derelict buildings downtown in 1980, needed some outside exterior art. And they came up with a $2,000 grant and had a multitude of sculptors come in, and that's where Dirk Cruiser's uh, energy really came from. I was number, I was runner up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get the next one. Uh, but I did uh, renovate that sculpture a number of years
deserve mentioning in terms of supporting the arts. And I wanted to second the uh, inspector business because I purchased the Leader Building in 1986, and we were the first family to move in downtown. There were people sleeping in the, in the uh, I have five children, and I raised them in that building, which is now Farm Burger. And the dance studio was on the first floor. We lived upstairs. That big picture window was our living room window, and you would have seen our Christmas tree in that window, and et cetera. We had a hell of a time with inspectors. I, I mean, you can imagine my husband, had, David Nelson, had a, um, a gas kiln, a huge gas kiln upstairs in that building. So um, artists, it wasn't just the river, it was also downtown. We were, as always, the vanguard, moving into the cheap places, renovating them, paying for that ourselves, inhabiting them, teaching our children to roller skate on the sidewalks downtown and float their boats in the Exona building, et cetera. So I just wanted to mention businesses and uh, moving into downtown way before gentrification of that area. Now the artists were often the canary that went into the <laughs> mine and proved that you could breathe the air and made it livable um, throughout much of the downtown. Hey folks, I'm Dan Lewis. Without them. 